uh, saints of God. Let's give a hand clap of appreciation for Pastor Matthew Davis and Sister Carolyn. Uh, we're going to get into some things today that, um, let's, do, let's do that one more time. Uh, uh, you clap and clap your hands off for entertainers, for athletes, and all of the other things. And uh, So let's give them a hand clap of appreciation. I really do uh, wonderfully appreciate this time here. And while you're standing, let us go ahead and bow for a moment of prayer um, as we're going to dive into the 10 feet from the jump. And I ask God to bless our time. Father, uh, it is in the name of Jesus that we come before you today, thanking you uh, for your grace and for your mercy. Uh, Lord God, we do celebrate you because you are worthy to be praised. Father, we count it a blessing and a privilege to stand in your house, and being able to experience a day that we've never seen before. It's not by our goodness, Lord God, but because of your faithfulness, that we are still yet here for one more day. We celebrate you on today, Lord. Uh, Father, we invite the power of the Holy Spirit into this place, that you would convict us, Lord God, that you would change us, that when we leave this place, we are the better. And Father God, that we have been empowered to live the life that you have called for us to live. We thank you. We thank you for this moment and this celebration. It is in Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. You may have your seats uh, in the household of God. I just want to get a couple of particulars out of the way. Um, first and foremost, I thank God um, for this opportunity to stand, and I do stand here with the complete authority of God and my senior pastor, Walter August Jr., senior pastor of One Church at Bethel's Family. And thank you for all of those who travel from Bethel's Family to come and support us here at New Beginnings. I do want to celebrate my wife, my rib, my baby mama, my J Bay, everything that is everything, my wife, Miss Jamie Holman of 23 years, a mother of my four children. And then I also have in the room today the mother that birthed me. Without this woman, I wouldn't be here. Amen. 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 You're responsible for all this. And also, Mon, Kathy, thank you so very much. Deacon Smith, all of those. Uh, Brother Milton, uh, Reverend Chris, thank you so very much uh, for joining us here uh, today. Um, this is... I've had the opportunity through the years to do more than my fair share of pastor's anniversaries. And I try to approach each one with a spirit of discernment uh, as to what God is doing in this particular house. While the work of the kingdom is universal, as we are all working to extend the kingdom of God, the assignments are different depending on the house. Uh, depending on the community, depending on what's going on around us. We all have the universal assignment, which is to extend the kingdom of God, offer salvation to men, women, boys, and girls. But the specific assignment may differ based on location. And so I try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as to discern what God is doing here at New Beginnings. And I'm going to give you a word that's going to be hard to chew on. And give you a word that's going to be hard to digest and will be convicting and challenging. Uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament. So that means we're going to have to get through some weeds to get to the shout. Uh, but we got to do a little bit of work first. So I want to take you over here to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations to the right of the book of Jeremiah. And we'll be in Lamentations chapter number three. And as if your custom when you get to Lamentations chapter number three, won't you go ahead and stand uh, for the reading of God's word? We'll be in Lamentations chapter number three, beginning at verse number 19. Lamentations chapter number three, verse number 19. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and here's what it says. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope that through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, 
says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And just for a few moments, I want to talk from this subject, the man behind the suit. The man behind the suit. Uh, New Beginnings, unfortunately, we are living in a time to where the office of pastor is looked at as a career rather than a calling. We have people standing behind the sacred desk that have no business standing behind the sacred desk. The Bible says that if you cannot govern your own house well, how then can you tend to the household of God? There are men out there that are receiving calls from their mama, their grandmama, their cousin, and everybody's telling them, boy, you're going to be a preacher. We have people standing in the stay of God that have not been qualified to stand. But I must tell you that I don't blame them because you look at the pastorship and the office of preacher pastor and you see a person that typically works on Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, spits out a couple of verses from the scriptures and gets paid handsomely. Who wouldn't want that kind of job? Uh, when you think about the helipads and the luxury cars and the big houses and the tailored suits, who wouldn't want that type of job? Who wouldn't want the job where everybody admires you and lifts you up? And so you're looking at the pulpit and looking at the office of pastor in our day from a very wrong perspective. Uh, When you're talking about this man named Jeremiah, they call him the weeping prophet. Uh, Jeremiah was called at the age of 17. And God has such an anointing on Jeremiah's life that he would have to experience things in his life as a pastor that no one else would. Imagine people coming to you for encouragement when you yourself need encouragement. Imagine when people come to you for answers when you yourself are looking for answers. Imagine seeking God for everybody but nobody seeking God for you. Imagine people coming asking, pray for me, pastor, but those same people are not praying for you. This is the life of a pastor. And far too many of us don't understand the value of a pastor. I come from Holman Street Baptist Church in Third Ward, Texas, and I can remember coming to church every single Sunday. And y'all remember, I'm talking to a, a good group that can remember these times where the pastor was revered. The pastor was respected in the community. I'm talking about the times where nobody dared come to the pulpit except you were a minister. I'm talking about the time where you had to dress your best to come into the household of God. I'm talking about when your mama used to put your clothes up the day before to make sure that you were sharp as a tack before you came to church. I'm talking about those times when the church was the beacon of the community. Now it is a free-for-all. We've lost respect in the household of God. We are now in a place to where you wouldn't dare be late at your job but we casually stroll into the household of God. You have a dress code on your job, but you come into God's house any old kind of way. We've lost the respect for the house. And it's because we have people that are standing in so-called stay of God that should not be there. The man behind the suit is not just the person that preaches on Wednesday and Sunday. This man carries the burdens of people every day of his life and oftentimes has to sacrifice in ways that others are not willing to sacrifice. He not only has to lead his wife, his children, and his own affairs, but then has to come here to New Beginnings and take on all of this and all of your issues as well. And at the same time, give glory unto God when at times he doesn't feel like it. This is Jeremiah's lot. Jeremiah is preaching to the northern kingdom. And this is after God had split the ten tribes up to the north. And the two southern tribes are getting ready to be captured by Babylon, Babylonia. And when God is using Jeremiah, he says to the people of Israel, I'm sending Jeremiah to preach to you until you're dull of hearing. 
want you to imagine Jeremiah's life that in Jeremiah 16, God forbids him to get married or have kids. God says, I'm not going to allow a spouse to come alongside of you and walk with you through this journey. Jeremiah, you're going to be all by yourself. Jeremiah, you're going to start preaching at 17, and you're going to preach for 40 years. But in those 40 years, you're not going to see any progression in your preaching. From the time that you start preaching, they're going to be penitent of hearing. And from the time that you finish, the same people are going to. You're not going to see any progress. You're not going to see the pews being filled to overflow capacity. You're not going to see all of these things. But for 40 years, I'm calling you to preach to a people. And so you look in verse number 19 and 20, you talk about the agony of the calling. There is an agony to carry a ministry. I say to God, it's a wonderful thing that you can come into a house and sit down in these pews, but everybody can leave new beginnings and go and do something except, and, and do something else except for these two people. All of y'all can decide to go to another church that fits your bag a little bit better, that has a better preacher, a better praise team, a better air condition. Everybody can leave except for two people. It's the agony of ministry. It's the agony of the calling. Look at what he says here. Remember my affliction and my Roman. I would dare you to take a journey through these five chapters of the book of Lamentations. Of the, lament, of the word Lamentations means to lament. It means to cry from the soul. And as you look at the book of Lamentations and even in the book of Jeremiah, God does not give us any happy moments in Jeremiah's life. I found that men that are sold out for the cause of Christ live with a burden. They live with a burden. It was just Friday, two days ago, that I stood at one church at Bethel's family, and there was a coffin about the size of the top of this pulpit with an eight-month-old baby in it. Right there in front of me, she looked like an angel, looked like she was asleep. But the pastor was called to stand and minister to the family, not the congregation. They didn't call the congregation. They didn't call the deacons. They called the pastor to minister to this mother, this grandmother, this father, about an eight-month-old baby that had died. Jeremiah talks about there's an agony to the calling when you have to counsel couples that are on the verge of divorce when you have to try to bring back wayward children who have left when you try to counsel people going through the valleys of life Jeremiah talks about remember my affliction and remember my roaming this is a pastor and I'm not talking about the glitz and the glam of you being able to go to your local tailor and get you a new suit. Far too many people look at this here as the end goal. Listen, God used a donkey. Anybody can do this. But are you willing to do the work that comes along with this? See, this is God's business on Wednesday and Sunday when I proclaim. It's what I do when I'm not up here that makes my calling sure. Am I a preacher on Monday the same way I was on Sunday? See, what I do up here is for y'all. See, the Monday through Sunday stuff, that's me and God. That affirms my calling. And Jeremiah said, there's an agony in this. There's an agony. When I got to look and know that there is a bill to be paid in the church, that the church doesn't have enough money to sustain. And what most pastors ain't going to tell you is that we got to oftentimes come out of our own pocket. See, y'all don't want to hear this. I know you might not ever invite me back, but I'm going to say what God needs me to say here. Sometimes we got to come out of our own pocket and sacrifice our own families so that y'all have a comfortable place to worship in. It's the agony of ministry. I don't know why anybody wants to be a pastor. 
I don't know why anybody would raise their hand and say, God, use me. No. Jeremiah talks about that there is an agony in this thing called ministry. And the book of Lamentations offers us insight into this man that was used by God. The Holy Spirit pulls back the veil and allows us to see into the life of Jeremiah. And I tell you this, if you would ask God to give you a behind-the-scenes look at your pastor, you would value him that much more. See, a lot of churches got people standing in the pulpit. But not every church has a pastor in the pulpit. Let me say that again for the people in the back. There's a lot of churches that got people standing in the pulpit, but there's not a lot of churches with pastors in the pulpit. And I found, Pastor Davis, that most churches want preachers and not pastors. They want somebody that's going to preach to them, but they don't want nobody telling them what to do. But see, a pastor is a shepherd. A pastor leads and guides and covers and protects. And when that sheep is going in the wrong direction, that shepherd has a responsibility to take his staff and snatch them back. But they don't want that. Just preach me a good message and make me feel good about my sin. That's what most of them want. That's why I can tell you that God is coming down your street and you've been suffering for a long time, but your season is coming through and we will shout the house down. But when I start talking about repenting from sin and turning away from your wicked ways, Jeremiah talks about that there's an agony in the calling. And a true man of God that's been sent by God walks with a burden. And it's a burden like no one in the pews could ever understand. That's why the Bible says that many are called, but the few are chosen. Because there's a burden that comes along with ministry. He not only says that, remember my affliction and my Roman, he says the wormwood and the gall. Watch this, this word wormwood means bitter. Uh, gall means irritation. Can I tell it to you plain, Brother Gilmore? It says this, that I got, listen, sometimes pastors get bitter and irritated. I'm going to let them behind the veil just for a little bit. The same emotions that you got to manage as just a child of God, we've got to manage as pastors of God. The same frustrations that you got to deal with are the exact same frustrations that he's got to deal with. But while you have him to come and lay all your burdens down before, who does he have to go to to lay his down to? He says this burden, this, this agony of the calling, this wormwood is bitter and it's irritating. I want you to think about knowing that you're preaching a word from God and yet you see no growth. Let, let me let it sit on you for a little bit. Just in case you are not under, uh, understanding, there's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. And, 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 and I'm, again, I'm peering them behind the veil. If, if, please hear this. It is not Pastor Davis's responsibility to grow new beginnings. It's your responsibility to grow new beginnings. God wouldn't have gave you all these chairs if he didn't want cheeks in the seats. But see, you waiting on him to grow the ministry. When growing the ministry is your job given to you by God. If you think that Pastor Davis comes up here and doesn't look at the pews and can be excited and or discouraged, you are fooling yourself. But how many of the members of New Beginnings say, hold on, I'm inviting somebody. I'm bringing somebody with me. The agony of the ministry is that sometimes Jeremiah got bitter and he got irritated with folks. 
I know y'all think pastors don't get irritated. I know you think pastors walk on clouds. I know you think we have no bad days. No, I, I know you think that, but Jeremiah said, hold on. There's some times I get bitter. I see a false teacher over there, and I know he's teaching wrong. But why is his parking lot full? Can y'all welcome me into the place? I thought I was at home. This is my brother. Uh, listen, I'm looking and I see a person not doing what God has called for them to do. And the outside looks deceiving. But I'm in here laboring. Once the church is closed, I got the vacuum and I'm vacuuming the floors. I'm cleaning the toilets. I'm dumping the trash when nobody else around. And God, when will? <laughs> Watch this. Jeremiah preached for 40 years and didn't see the people change. Pastor Davis, they can't see it, but a perspective from here to the pews is a different vantage point. Because as I got the Bible open, preaching from the book of Lamentations, chapter number 3, beginning at verse number 19, preaching God's word, there are people that really look like they can be somewhere else. But the same people will get on Netflix and binge entire series. Won't fall asleep. We'll go to the movies and won't fall asleep. But in the house where the word of God is going forward, I can literally be somewhere else. Now, I remember as a child being next to my mother at Holman Street and having the audacity to fall asleep in church. Come on, grandmamas, talk back to me. You would get that pinch on your ear or in your arm to wake up. How many of y'all remember them days? BTU and being in church all day long. Oh, don't you dare eat candy. But the church now has become accommodating to the people. And this is Jeremiah's, this is his valley. If you look in verse number 21, you talked about the agony of the call. Look at verse number 21. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope, though the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Wow. Jeremiah talks about the agony of the calling, Pastor Davis. He also talks about I need to have faith in the one that called me. He is putting his attention because we can do this. As much as we love God, as much as we pray, as much as we exegete the text, there are times in which we can get out of focus. I'm, I'm letting you behind the veil. There are times in which we as pastors can get out of focus. There are times in which we don't have the might to keep on moving. There's some times he's not going to tell you. Maybe he won't tell you publicly, but there's some times between him and God alone where he questions the, about what he's doing. God, give me clarity about what you've had for me to do. Jeremiah says that though I got some people that I'm preaching to and they're not responding, I got to keep my eyes on the one who called me. Oh, and say, God, let me just admonish your pastor here just for a second. I know the numbers may not look the way that you want them, though I know ministry may not be bustling like you think it should, but I want you to keep your eyes on Jesus because as we keep our eyes on him, we want to hear from him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Can I tell you something, pastor? We want to hear from him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Come now, I'll make you ruler over many. Can I tell you how much the Lord admonishes pastors that there is a crown that only pastors get? There is a crown that only called men of God will receive. It's called a crown of life. And the crown of life will only be given to those who were called to lead God's people. That's how much God admonishes pastors. 
that I got a special reservation just for you if you stay faithful to the assignment by which I call. And Jeremiah says, with all that is going on, I got to keep my eyes on the one that called me. I got to keep my eyes off of a pastor and the first gentleman. I got to keep my eyes off of pastors marrying same-sex people. I got to stop myself from being discouraged when I see all of this foolishness happening in the church and keep my eyes on the one that called me. Sometimes that's a hard job. Jeremiah said that it's agony. It's agony. But I got to keep my eyes on the one that called. Behind the veil even more. If you want to know the man, look at the woman. See, let me tell you something. I have learned by trial and by error to love that woman more than I love ministry. I've learned through trial and through error. Now, pastors, listen, listen. Sometimes pastors are more of a father in the ministry than they are to their own kids. Sometimes we're more of a spouse to the church than we are to our own spouses. We miss baseball games for our kids because of functions at the church. May it not be. May it not be. May it not be. As you look at a woman that walks alongside of a husband, please hear this. There is not a calling for the man, the husband, the pastor that does not include the walking with his wife. He's the pastor of New Beginnings Church. But I promise you something. Sister Davis has been there to offer a shoulder to cry on. See, y'all don't understand this. Y'all don't understand this. Uh, the, the, the woman has been there to be baby. It's going to be all right. When he is crying his heart out, she's been there in the valley of ministry to push him forward. There's been times that had it not been for her, he wouldn't have been here. Don't nobody want to say amen to it, but it's fine. I'm letting you behind the veil. In Genesis chapter number two, the Bible says, I will make him a helper. The same word helper, the etymology of the word is the same word for Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And he says, I'm going to give you a helper that's going to help you do what I've called for you to do. Please hear this. Please hear this. Please hear this. Don't sacrifice your marriage for ministry. They don't love you like that. Don't you put your marriage on the altar of ministry. God ain't called for you to do that. And so he talks about this agony, but then he talks about keeping his eyes on Jesus. And if I can just skate around the cul-de-sac and come back out on the main road. Jeremiah here is at a point to where he has been preaching so long, but sees no change. Your pastor is an evangelist at heart. I don't know if you knew that, New Beginnings. He is an evangelism bleeds through his bones. Concerned about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to every man, woman, boy, and girl. He is, he is concerned about extending the Great Commission. This is what he does. But Jeremiah is in a point to where he is preaching what God has laid upon his heart time and time and time and time and time again. But yet he sees no change in the people that God has told him to preach to. And Jeremiah is getting to the point to where he has to refocus. He says here in verse number 21, I recall to mind. And you'll see this word remember and recall. You'll see this word 47 times in five chapters. Meaning that Jeremiah has to sit back and think to get recalibrated. 
And what we have to do sometimes, Pastor, is even when the valleys are in front of us, is we got to sit back and remember when we were walking with God and he moved mountains in our lives. Jeremiah now is sitting here remembering the goodness that God has bestowed upon him. And he said this, therefore, I have hope. Now, remember, remember my affliction and my roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My, my soul sinks within me, verse 19 and 20. And then in verse number 21, he says, therefore, I have hope. I still have hope, even though I don't see what I think I should be seeing. Saints, what a word for the church today that we are called the salt and the light of the earth. The world acts the way that it do because the church acts the way that she does. The world is just the reflection of what's going on in the household of God. God did not call City Hall. He did not call the State House. He did not call 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to be the light and the salt of the world. That's not what he did. He said, church, you are the one that have the Holy Spirit. You are the salt and the light of the world. So whenever I go into a dark place, I illuminate darkness. Demons should know when you walk into spaces. The light should come on. And Jeremiah is remembering and he's saying that, Lord, even though this, I have hope. Uh, Pastor Davis, my wife is here that will affirm to you in 2003 to 2010 when I was a senior pastor of the Point of Grace Church. And the difficulties of ministry. The difficulties, and I shared this with Bethel's family because what I've, what I've always said is I want to take the aha moments away from people. So I just tell you all my business. Because you ain't going to never come up to me and say aha. I'm be like, no, nah, I already said that. So I talk about the difficulties of ministry from 2003 to 2010. And in 2010, when we went on our first mission trip to Kenya, Africa, God illuminated my eyes. God showed me a vision that was so much bigger than where he had me at that particular time. And God instantly infused in me hope for this gospel message. And I want you to hear this. I was preaching to a people for seven years where I saw no change. And I was in a very bad place in the ministry. I, I was trying to encourage people where I myself needed the encouragement that I was given out. I needed that encouragement to come back to the pulpit, but the people were not responding in the way in which I thought. And this preacher, pastor, teacher, was discouraged to the degree of wanting to give up. The only family that I had was right there and my four kids. The only ones that never left me was right there, my four kids. Didn't get a lot of amens and hallelujahs from any other people. But one person was there every step of the way. Every step of the way. No other family. No other homeboys. No people from CBS and seminary and all these people I took classes with. None of them came to the Point of Grace Church. But while we were struggling in ministry, God sustained us. And in 2010, gave us a fresh vision of what he wanted us to do. So now when I go and encourage pastors, I go and encourage pastors with a real sense of understanding the difficulty in pastoring. And that you need to encourage your pastor. You need to catch the vision. You need to take the vision outside of new beginnings. You got to do some work too. If you want to see God's kingdom come. He says, therefore, I have hope. And why? He says, through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed. Jeremiah says, God can take us all out. But the mere fact that God keeps a remnant for himself is evident of his compassion. Listen to me, saints. I believe that not all churches should be open. Now, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. The church is always going to be open, but some churches shouldn't be open. Let me open it up for you. Uh, go down 610, make it right on MLK. Start from 610 and go all the way down. By the time you get down there towards the beltway, you have passed 
about 50 churches on one street. Have you seen South Park lately? 50. Have you seen the condition? Have you seen the crime? 50 churches on one street. Steeples everywhere. Everywhere that you look. Pastor this, pastor that, bishop this, bishop that. This missionary Baptist church, that missionary Baptist church. But look at the environment that the church is in and you see no change. You take it over there to Bethel's family off of 12660 Sandpiper and within five square miles, there are 42 churches around Bethel's family. Within five square miles. Why are all these churches everywhere? And if these churches are everywhere, why are we not seeing the change that churches are supposed to implement? Why are we seeing community stability going down in the midst of multiple churches? Watch this. Jeremiah said, we're not all consumed. God has left for himself a remnant And please hear this, New Beginnings. Please hear this. New Beginnings is in your name, and New Beginnings is what God expects. When you leave this place every Wednesday, every Sunday, or whatever day you may gather, you're supposed to leave differently than when you walked in the building. It's a new beginning. Keep your eyes and keep faith in the one that called you. He says in verse number 23, as my time is quickly coming to a close, he says, your mercies are new every day morning. Uh, I'm going to look at the Davises. Um, God says all you got to do is keep getting up in the morning. I know enough to know that there's some mornings you don't want to get up. Let me let that sit on you. I know enough to know that life can get so hard at times that your bed becomes your best friend. No good Christians are going to say amen to that, but I know it's the truth. But he says his mercies are new every morning. The Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It's going to be bad before it gets better. Before the highest mountaintop, you got to go through the lowest valley. So he says that his mercies are new every morning. Now, what is mercy? God has given me mercy. That means God has not given me what I deserve. Saints of God, can I tell you something? That God picks you out and says, I want you to join in with me with what I'm doing on the earth. What a privilege. You don't use this sacred desk to beat out of people a lifestyle that you desire upon yourself. For filthy lucre's sake, the Bible talks about. It is a privilege to be called by God. Matthew Matthew Davis was called by God to say, come and work in my vineyard. But if you got a call from the 44th president of the United States and say, come to the White House. You would move heaven and earth. You call the job and say, I'm not coming in tomorrow. If you didn't have money, you go to the pawn shop and pawn everything you had to get a ticket to go to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue because one Barack Obama called you or beckoned you to the White House. And when you got to the gates, you would get there boldly and you would say, Barack called me. Who are you? Well, Barack called me. Can you call Barack? Because he personally asked me to come. Boldly standing there because the president called you. And we'll walk into the White House, skate across those marble floors, into the stateroom, in this immaculate room where all of these big chairs at and all the big name people of the Americas and all around the world. And here you go where Barack Obama says this, you come sit right here next to me. And you walk past all them other good people because they sitting in the back and you've been personally called to sit here to the front and you sit down nice and slow so that everybody sees you sit down. (laughs) Because Barack called you. The president called you and said, come sup with me. Well, if you'll do that for the president, what about when God calls you? 
and pulls you out. So when I get to heaven, they'll be like, why are you here? Well, Jesus called me uh, back on my seat right over there because he said, I'm going to make a table for you. See, <laughs> there's a privilege in being called. I'm a pastor. And I hold that with honor. You are to be esteemed. Because they're not calling the deacon at 3 o'clock in the morning to go down to Methodist. You're a pastor. And you should be honored. But the man behind the suit has some issues that he takes to God. You'll see this finally as we bring this to a close in verse number 24. You'll find that the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him and the soul of him who seeks him. It is good for the one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So he talked about the agony of the calling. He talked about keep faith in the one that called him. And then he finally says, Pastor Davis, there's victory in my calling. You got some times in which God used you to do some things. Uh, you, you sit back in your office or maybe at your house and, and you think about that time that you had that meeting with that one person. And, and you encourage them. And then a couple of years later, they come back to you and say, Pastor Davis, remember when we were talking back there and you encouraged me? Well, look at my life since we've talked. And you're able to gain some confidence that God used you in a moment. To speak into somebody's life. What an awesome thing it is when people come to you and say, Pastor, you've blessed me. Pastor, I am better in my life because of you and what God is doing through you to get to me. Isn't it a blessing to hear those testimonies? So even though Jeremiah was struggling, even though he saw some things that he didn't like to see, even though there were some difficulties in his ministry, he got to the place of saying this, the Lord is my portion. I want to look at you personally and tell you that the race is not given to the swift. You're going to finish. Let me finish this. There was uh, the Special Olympics that happened about 10 years ago, and there was a man by the name of Walter Ames. And Walter Ames was doing the 17-mile a marathon for Special Olympics. And what had happened was, as the race began to go, this person came across five, six hours later, this person came across, and the last person came across at around 4.30. Uh -huh. And they began to shut the things down, take up the barriers, and what you see as you watch this on TV, there is somebody that comes and says, hold on! We got one more guy that's still running. Now, they were ready to take down the barriers and take down the lights and shut the whole thing down. But there was one guy, Walter, that was still running. But he was a long way behind. And so everybody has to now wait for Walter to finish the race. And as Walter gets to one mile, you see this on the video, he gets to one mile, he gets to a quarter mile, and then he falls down at around about 100 yards to go. By this time, cameras had come back out. The people that had raced had come back to the finish line. And what a remarkable thing that some of those runners who had crossed almost three to four hours before get up and go pick up Walter. And they're walking with him slowly. Slowly walking with Walter. And they pick him up and his feet are dragging. And they walk him over the finish line. Watch this. And as he gets over the finish line, he falls down to his knees, exhausted. As he falls down to his knees, everybody there, cameramen, all the people that had come back to the finish line, begin to give extraordinary praise about this man that had finished the race. Can I tell you something? It's not the place that he finished. It's the fact that he finished. See, y'all ain't me. Y'all see. See, you so concerned about first place, second place, third place, fifth place. It's the fact that he finished. 
And here's what Jeremiah says. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is going to have you finish the race. Don't worry about finishing first. And don't worry about finishing with this many members and this many programs and this kind of building. and all. No, you finish. Because your Lord have mercy. I, I got, it's, it's 1135. I got to get out. But listen. It's not the place that he finished. It's the fact that he finished. And God is asking us to finish well. If you got to crawl across the finish line, you better get to crawling. If you got to cry across the finish line, you better get to crying. If you got to look up to God stomping your feet, you better stomp your feet over that finish line. The Lord is my portion. That's the victory of the calling. Saints, hear this. When you get to heaven, and I'm done, when you get to heaven, you're going to be looking at God. I imagine this in my mind's eye all the time, Pastor. And God's going to tap me and tell me to look back. And I see it in my mind's eye so clearly that God's going to show me the people that made it to heaven because I was obedient in doing what God called me to do. That's some people that's going to make it to heaven because of what you're doing. The messages that you think are not being heard, oh, but one needs to hear. There are people that are being introduced to God and his glory because of what God is doing through you. The Lord is my portion. And saints of God, as you are looking at this couple, I want to make sure that you know that God favors them. And it's not just a preacher talking about another preacher. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. When God has favored somebody, you need to get close to the favor. Favor overflows. <laughs> favor overflows. So it's my job to be as close as the one that's got favor so that as God is favoring him, I get a little bit of favor too, Gilmo. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, the man behind the suit, the woman in the dress, please hear this. They sow, they sacrifice, they pray, they admonish, they teach for you. A man that can go some places and make a whole lot of other money doing a whole lot of other stuff other than preaching. As I take my seat, Pastor Davis, Dr. Martin Luther King received his Ph.D. at 26 years old. He was given an introductory offer letter by IBM, fresh out of school, for $100,000. The equivalent in our dollars today would be about $320,000 for a 26-year-old man. But because Martin Luther King has such a higher calling on his life, he turned that down. Now watch this. Martin Luther King died broke. Coretta Scott King didn't have an insurance policy to fall back on. But look, here we are 50, 60 years after the death of this man that sold his life into people. Because the calling was so much higher. He could go other places. He's a very smart and intelligent man. He could go other places and do other things. But God has him here sowing into you. And it is a position that is worthy of honor. It is a position that is worthy of your respect. It is a position that is worthy of your partnership. It is worthy of your sow. It is worthy because God is using this couple here at New Beginnings. And saints so God, I want you to know that your work in the Lord, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He knows your name. If I could sing that song, if, if I was a singing preacher, boy, y'all be in trouble. But I can't sing. <laughs> but boy, y'all be in trouble if I was a singing preacher. God won't give me the gift, though. So I got to sing to my wife. But I want to I want to bless you. And if I can, as I take my seat, I would like everybody just to stand 
and send forth your hands toward uh, the Davises. Just send forth your hands toward the Davises. Because uh, there is indeed an agony of the calling. But please keep your eyes on the one that called you. Because there's also victory in the calling. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I uh, lift up this dynamic couple to you, Father. Father, asking them that you would abundantly, uh, Lord God, bless them in ways that they've never been blessed before. I pray that you would lift them up. Father, whatever prayers they have been laying before the throne room of God, Father, you take those prayers and you exponentially, Lord God, answer them. Father, I pray right now for New Beginnings Church, Lord, that you would move this church in a way that it has never been moved before, that you would enlarge its territory, that there would not be a house, a business, a person anywhere around this area that would not be impacted with the ministry that is happening right here, right now. So, Father, encourage them right now, Lord God. Uh, encourage him that when he's in his study and he's studying the word of God, that, Father, that you're there with him. That when he's preaching and he's preaching and he's preaching, that, Father, that you're there with him. When Sister Carol is teaching music and ministering through her gift, Lord, that you're right there with her. Father, encourage them right now in Jesus' name. Assure them that you have everything under your capable control. Father, bless you for this time. Bless you for all that you are doing and have done. We love you. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. And let's give the Davises a hand clap of praise and appreciation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Man, I love you. Um, Pastor August sends his greetings. Bethel's family sends their greetings. And thank you for all that you do. You are a treasure in the kingdom of God. Amen.